global meetings panel how our shared humanity can help us to transition to a better world. My name is Martina Fox. I'm an international TV anchor and business journalist currently working for China's Sinhua News Agency and I'm based uh, in London and today in Zurich, Switzerland. It's a great pleasure to see you all virtually and to have this uh, discussion on this very, very important topic with everybody today. Here with me, I would like to introduce our distinguished panel are Diana Arama. She's uh, the founder and managing director of Main Fair Networking Events in the United Kingdom. Welcome, Diana. Thank you. We have Sergi Chabani. He's the founder of Silica Biomassa Energia from Slovenia. Hello, Sergi. Hi. With us also is Lotfi El Khanduri, who's the founder of the Creative Society Group, joining us from Spain. Hello. We have Maxim Chago, he's a futurist, a filmmaker, and author, joining us from the United Kingdom. And Hello. Last but definitely not least, we have Kuber Shirasi, who's the co-founder of the Peace Through Prosperity uh, organization, also joining us from the UK. Very, very warm well welcome to all of you. It's a great pleasure to see you all and joining us from different locations in the world. I would like to encourage all our audiences, all our participants to drop questions and comments also on the right-hand side of your screens. We really have a very interactive and dynamic session, which will last for 45 minutes and will include questions um, either during uh, the conversation or at the end of the panel. So first of all, I would like to invite all of our panelists in 60 seconds. Tell me in an opening statement, how can our shared humanity help us to transition to a better world? I would like to start with Sergey. Tell us what is your opening statement. Thank you very much, Martina. Look, uh, not too much time, yes, 60 seconds, but Swiss time. I think, yeah, I think the main is that humanity recognize now the fragility of our civilization. And we are one fragile world and we can save our world and our planet only all together in a joint effort or we do not save it. That's a great opening statement, very on point. Uh, Maxim, uh, let's go with you next. In a... 60 seconds. <laughs> Absolutely as well. Uh, okay, I would say two things that are fundamental to this debate. The first is that, to the best of our knowledge, there is actually just one life on Earth with an enormous amount of beautiful and extraordinary diversity. We are related to every living thing and share DNA with every living thing on Earth. So we need to stop thinking about different siloed needs and interests and start to recognize that we are part of one cohesive family that includes other people, other tribes, other cultures, other species. We are part of one system. And as an extension of that, I'd say it's crucial that we recognize the fallacy of the concept of us and them. This concept of us and them has been used by politicians and false leaders for millennia to persuade us to hate one another, to dehumanize and demonize and, and betray one another. If we can realize that there never was a them, we can begin to make progress with working together collaboratively. Thanks, so Maxim. Uh, you hinted at uh, global warming and climate change as well. I'm sure you saw uh, the latest uh, documentary by Zurich and Edinburgh as well. So definitely talking about all these issues as well. Kuber, you're up next. Hello, everyone. Um, that's. It's I think Sergey uh, and Maxime have summed it up well. It is all about connectedness and the pale blue dot, as Carl Sagan put it. We're one planet, we're one people. You know, as Sergey said, it's about time we, we did away with blinders that the media or, or, or people or institutions have made us wear and look at each other as fellow beings, you know, and, and, and protect each other, serve each other, and serve our planet. You know, because as Carl Sagan says, said, is the only one we will ever know. It's our only home. And we, the, the inhabitants of it, we need to behave more like a family. 
<coughs> as for each other. There is no planet B, as uh, we say, isn't there? Fantastic. Next up, uh, Lotfi, tell us uh, your opening statement. Um, totally agree with everything was said. Uh, how I say it is, are we able to jump into being bold and instead of tapping into fears, tapping into, into the true hope? Because in humanity, I have to be aware of the collective. And right now, fears leads us to be selfish. And social media <laughs> nurtures this ego space of always thinking by myself. So if we have the courage to just step in into uh, being bold and believing in the community, stepping in, having, being generous towards the other first, and having faith that if we all win, I will win. And that's a big, big challenge because... As we know, fear is the fuel of uh, many change, but also is the way to get focused on oneself. So are we able to be community-centered instead of self-centered? And I think that's a challenge we have. And by being community-centered, we'll see the humanity and we see uh, that we are one. Absolutely. And COVID-19 should have shown us as well that we are in this fight against the virus together. Last but not least, uh, Diana, what is your opening statement? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here on this panel. Um, I would like to draw everybody's attention that uh, humanity uh, consists from us being uh, caring, um, empathetic, you know, and also cultivating these traits in, in us. So it's uh, very important, you know, um, each other learn about themselves, you know, self-development, you know, uh, taking care about um, how they do business, for example, how they interact with people. So they uh, cultivate those great traits. So, and how we can benefit in the future. Of course, everybody wants to do business and to deal with people who are having in integrity, who are caring, you know, who, who will do what he, he said. He, he would do and so on. So um, I think this is my, uh, you know, opening statement that we need to cultivate those great traits of being a human. And just be kind with one another. That's just the basic fundamental, isn't it? Let's kick off with our conversation now. And I would like to ask the first question to Lutfi. Uh, Lutfi, in our pre-conversation to today, uh, to this panel, um, you mentioned to me that we need to shift the culture from selfies to purposes. And I really love this expression, selfies to purposes, like really having a, a purpose, right, in the center yeah. of attention. Can you maybe elaborate and tell us a little bit what you mean in specific by that? Um, this came out when, like, uh, people were trying to, uh, to meet famous people, and what they do is they don't care about a person anymore. They don't talk with it. It's like, can I get my picture? And I don't need anybody to help me take the pictures. I take my own picture. So can we switch the lens from the self to the purpose? And what is a challenge and anything? Can we go back to the, to the purpose instead to the self? So many people will talk about this is what's happening to me. This is what it's going on to me, but what's going on for the collective? Because probably if I'm ready to lose a little bit, because I know the collective will win, I will win more. So for me, the shift is about moving from self to purpose. And, and if we move right the lens, this is what we're going to happen. We saw it with, I, I was really shocked with the search that you talked about COVID-19. And I was shocked that everyone's rushing for toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, come on, guys. <laughs> like, there's something I am behind it. It's not about me. It's about the we. And that's a big leap of faith. That's why if we focus on the right purpose, we're all going to unite because it's bigger than us and we're part of it. And toilet paper is a human uh, need and a universal need as well. And that actually brings me to the next uh, question to uh, Maxime. Maxime, you mentioned that most... Um, you know, needs are universal that we have. Now, what kind of new maybe frameworks uh, for governance and also collaboration are needed in your opinion so that we have a more equitable future in the world for everyone? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, uh, I think someone mentioned earlier that 
in order to understand our world, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Diana mentioned, we need to understand ourselves. Uh, you know, in the Gnostic temple over the entrance to the temple, it used to say, know thyself. And the more profoundly you come to know yourself, uh, the more profoundly automatically you come to know others. Uh, they say, uh, of course, you cannot love others unless you first love yourself. But I think there's other aspects of this. For example, is it possible for you to have compassion for others if you have no compassion for yourself? And if you cannot uh, perceive yourself without judging yourself, can you perceive others without judging them? So I think that we need to have an uh, unflinching readiness to understand our needs and to recognize that nobody ever makes a bad decision on purpose. And to get through this uh, false attribution of negative intent where we presume that when, when we do bad things, oh, it was just an accident, the sun was in my eyes, I wasn't concentrating. But when other people do bad things, they were absolutely intending to hurt you and they knew exactly what they were doing. And this is nonsense. When we make peace with our own humanity, I think we automatically make peace with the humanity of others. And there's a two parts to this. There's a coin, right? On one side of the coin is coming to know yourself and therefore understanding others better, but also the more time you spend with others and learn to understand them, the more profoundly you understand yourself. So I think uh, taking action and experience non-judgmentally is a, a key to open that door. That's very deep talk. Thank you so much for uh, this input, uh, Maxi. Kuber, um obviously our virtual connectivity has spiked during COVID-19. We're all here online together. Now, Post COVID 19, and hopefully um, it will be very soon over with uh, the virus. What kind of connectedness would you like to see? What kind of a hybrid format or more in person meetings or virtual meetings would you like to imagine? Go, going, going back to in person would be good, but that's not going to happen anytime soon. And, and even when we step out of COVID touch wood soon, it's going to be the new normal. Right. So, so digital is here to stay. What we need to figure out is how do we connect digitally? How do we make time to get to know Lutfi, Diana, Maxime, Sergi, and Martina, uh, as opposed to jumping straight into something? Into, and you could say, you know, follow with, you know, lead with empathy and follow with purpose. You know, to borrow words from Lutfi and Diana, is, is what I'd like to see more happen. Um, that way we can we can uh, you know we can we can share we can start knowing individuals like we did it, but in through a different medium, right? For me, that is connectedness. Where you know uh, when we talk to each other, we're not just panelists; we're human beings with some empathy, some understanding, some relationship with one another. And to expand that to our world of work, sometimes I, I feel people forget that it is people we're working with rather than just avatars or just pictures on our screen. And we should make the time to get to know them, you know, and, and, and going with ourselves, make time for them to get to know us earnestly as well. So, so we're, we're connected in that sense rather than waiting to go back to a world where we could physically truly connect. So that be, but that be, that that be, you know, that that's what's kind of like going on in my head in terms of connectedness, and just kind of picking up on that. That's also going to need for that to work for us, like you know, university. That's also going to need a paradigm shift from fiefdoms to community, you know, from fiefdoms of an enterprise to a community to an enterprise or enterprises recognizing that they occupy a tiny space in this global community. And they have certain responsibilities, you know, to borrow Spider-Man's uncles where with great power and influence comes great responsibility. And, and true, individually, we need to take up that responsibility, but we also need to enforce, you know, uh, I wouldn't use something lighter like suggest, but enforce for enterprises we work for and we work with that take up your responsibility, you know, help us connect and connect to the wider ecosystem that you exist in. That's super important. Thank you so much, uh, Kuber. On that point, uh, Diana, you are in the networking business uh, with your company made there in the heart of London. And obviously, um, it's very difficult now to network. We need to build trust. Uh, so usually, 
Um, I prefer to have face-to-face -face meetings, of course. Um, how have you observed this whole development over the past uh, year? And do you think it's rather positive or negative for your business to now have more virtual meetings? Uh, yes, I, I run a, a business uh, networking event company. And um, throughout about three years since I started company, I ran events every month. Uh, and usually the attendees are from all over the world. So I, I actually connect people globally. Um, it's it's very very difficult time now because mostly I do marketing and PR online and uh, the business of course is uh, completely changed for me. Uh, so I do a lot of uh, online. I I do you know I had to learn uh, you know Zoom. I had to learn a lot of gadgets which I, <laughs> I don't really like. Uh, you know I'm that old uh, classic style. You know where you go to Mayfair with nice restaurant. You know. Uh, you know, glass of champagne, <laughs> and, 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 and that's how we were connecting and, you know, chatting, you know, connecting on a personal level because business in London, at least in, in Mayfair, it's very personal. People like to, you know, congratulate each other with birthdays, you know, know each other closer. And that's when they can get that trust, um, you know, again, and it's based on uh, human qualities. It's much easier to connect with a kind uh, and lovely person, uh, in opposed to a grumpy who has no uh, principles. <laughs> so I would just like to to, to quickly say that uh, I feel it's very important um, to uh, to keep to keep you know uh, connecting, to keep uh, helping each other. I think it's very important to help each other even. On the street, I, I tell you quickly. Yesterday, uh, a gentleman felt uh, sick on the street and he fell down. So I, uh, I pulled him up, and I called nine nine nine. And um, amazing job from our NHS. They came in five minutes. Two cars while, while I was on the phone with nine nine nine. And you know, uh, I was talking to to this man, and he said to me, you know, he was uh, epileptic. And I said, quickly, quickly, come. So. I helped and the, the guys came, you know, took him in the car. And you know how I felt? I felt amazing. I, I, I felt um, that I've done something, uh, you know, super, super good. Yeah. And uh, that's uh, the question of, you know, doing something with different purpose from just money making. Uh, you know, I think uh, it's important for all of us to also, you know, I know it's difficult for businesses, but, you know, we have money, you know, targets, sales targets. But again, if you do something like this, you feel amazing. You feel uh, over the moon, and uh, it's a different. It's, it's a different feel. This is useless, uh, right? We cannot put any price tag on that. And uh, you might have saved this gentleman's life after yes. all. And really, these kind of gestures of humanity are so super important. As you know, I just got back from London, and these past couple of days, just seeing the city, um, finding back to you know um, life again, and this kind of renaissance and, and springtime has been really beautiful and, and seeing people connecting again as well. So hopefully yes. we'll have more face-to-face -face meetings again soon there in uh, Central yeah. London. Sergey, you are up for a great mission with your company in uh, Slovenia. Basically, you are using sustainable technologies for clean tech biomass processing and you work with agribusinesses and commodities trading companies and so on in the renewable energy sector. Tell us a little bit about your mission and vision to uh, help transition to a better world. Well, uh, we obviously what we are doing, we, we produce materials that uh, recently were not available on a large scale uh, and which by substituting existing raw materials, materials serve to produce uh, different sustainable goods. Uh, and contribute to CO2 savings and help to save energy resources and uh, reserve uh, nat natural reserves such as water. And uh, just to give you more understanding what I'm talking about, like, f for example, uh, we are making the vertically integrating uh, solutions starting from the agricultural production of biomass and uh, uh, processing this biomass to, uh, for example, uh, non-woody pulp. And non-woody pulp, this is the raw material and feedstock for paper, for 
molded uh, packaging production like caps, you know, uh, biodegradable uh, containers, food containers, uh, carton boxes, etc., etc., etc. Or the same biomass we, for example, can use for bioconcrete production. And this bioconcrete, this is much better in terms of energy uh, uh, and uh, energy savings because when you have the, the house from bioconcrete, it's like thermos. Yeah, it's not distributing energy in in winter time, and and also it's accumul it's accumulating energy, and it's not so hot in in, in summer time. You know. Uh, and also we can use this biomass for uh, medium density boards production, also construction materials or furniture material, but also you can produce fuel from this. I mean, you can produce spirit and uh, this spirit you can, you can use as the liquid biofuel. So I believe that uh, what we are doing, this is, this is like next step of the, of the transportation, of the transformation of our, of our, our mankind yeah, and civilization from fossil based to to renewables yeah because as it's obvious for everybody we we have only one planet and our resources are are limited yeah from other side we are we are now living like a push a bottom civilization uh, and uh, i mean just look it's one click and we are talking now all together without any distance limits yeah like 200 100 years ago it was not nobody could imagine this mm -hmm. i mean if for example some ancient guys romans or barbarians uh, would be here they would think that we are gods you know but because we are we are really we are flying from continent to continent yeah we are driving uh, suvs going to the stores full with with food with drinks and it's it's like some kind of you know uh, fairy machine, yeah, what civilization is, it looks like fairy machine, but indeed we are very fragile. Uh, I mean, our world is fragile. If we, if we will not use economically and efficiently our resources. And look. imagine if our ancestors could soon see us on a hyperloop or on automatic, you know, vehicles and so on, uh, in capsules flying around. That would be absolutely crazy, right? Yeah, but, but that, that's a good thing. But the bad thing is that uh, you know, and this is the main, I, I believe this is the main lesson from, from COVID uh, pandemic, that we were living in some kind of an artificial illusion that currently our humankind, our civilization is uh, nearly, is not nearly as dependent on uh, natural hazards, yeah, because of our modern technologies or our globalized yeah. uh, economy, finance, trade, and uh, that all these together can mitigate the effect of uh, any of such impacts, like pandemia or climate change, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, COVID-19 pandemic is a shock for humanity because of a clear recognition that our push-button civilization that we built is a whole lot more fragile than we thought. And I believe now it's everybody understand this, yeah? Because we must definitely play new uh, because our, our you know. machine of civilization of civilization, yeah. this is actually the network of systems. Mm -hmm. This is food supply system, this is energy supply system, this is financial system, transportation system. It's like a layer, like a cake. Yeah. Absolutely. And when uh, one of them let's move on to the next speaker, um, Sergey, so yeah. that everybody has enough time. Uh, Lotfi, um, would you agree with what Sergey is saying? Um, I mean, one lesson from the COVID-19 pandemic has also been, and something that you have pointed out in the past, is that we are not born equal, right? Some people have incredible privileges, you know, to be born, for example, me in Switzerland, and now during the COVID pandemic, it has been rather a paradise to go out, be able to, you know, exercise and do sports uh, compared to other countries. So um, how do you think can we make sure that everybody, you know, can reach the so-called finish line that you have mentioned before? Tell us about it. Um, yeah, this is true. We, we uh, like, um, my parents moved from their home countries, not by choice, <laughs> uh, but by needs. And, and I think that impacted me a lot on uh, how can we create uh, conditions for people to, to have the right to reach a finish line. I don't care. You can do it by car. Some people, we need to walk, but we need to have the right uh, 
to 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 ex- uh, achieve it. And the issue we're having is that um, we create a system that let people left behind, um, and we need to create a system that everyone can achieve. And if everyone achieves, our health system is less expensive. Uh, there's less crime if everyone wins, and. It's very important. I would like to go back to uh, to Maxim on. I really like the word he used. That was compassion. And sometimes on our world, what we see is that we have mercy instead of compassion. And when we have mercy, we remove dignity to the other people. So we act as a savior. And instead of once again nurturing the purpose, we're nurturing ourselves. Am I supporting people? because I truly believe in their potential and I dignify them for, the, for us to reach uh, the right purpose, or I'm doing it because it's good for the picture, it's good for the audience, and I'm exposing my kindness. And that's why for me, we need to allow people to reach that finish line by providing the rights to provide uh, dignity. And if we protect dignity through compassion, we don't need any more mercy, and that can happen. I don't know if it makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. Very, very deep and, and strong words, uh, Lotfi. Um, for our audience, you can drop uh, questions as well in the comment section uh, on the right-hand side of your screen if you would like to ask any question to our panelists here. Um, Maxim, so you have traveled around the world with your work as a screenwriter, you're an award-winning film director, and so on. Um, and so you have obviously realized that we are all connected as a human race together and are, you know, independent uh, as well as what um, Lotfi mentioned before. So how would you like us to better communicate with uh, one and another, you know, post-COVID-19? Well, I'm actually super optimistic about the future. Uh, My friends sometimes accuse me of being just an optimist, but I would say I'm an optimistic realist. And I think that if you are truly a realist, you become an optimist. You have to really get the data though, you know? You've got to look at what's actually happening in the world. And in spite of recent news, for example, we have less conflict, less active conflict in the world today than there has been since records began. Our definition of poverty is a higher quality of life than we've ever had. And although there's many, many people in poverty, uh, the standards are going up and up and up. And proportionally, it's not changing that much. So we have a lot to be optimistic about. I think that our future threats are socioeconomic. And, uh, you know, we are moving, for example, towards the autonomous robotics revolution. It's happening now. And we have to ask ourselves what we'll do with unskilled laborers, which are a cornerstone of the global economy. How are we going to have compassion for their lives and give value? And I think we need to step away from a meritocracy, a way of examining value based on what people do, and instead perhaps see them in terms of their potential and what they can do, could do. But I think in terms of communication, things are amazing. You know, as Sergey mentioned, look at us. And, and it's effectively free. You know, we've got to have an internet connection and a computer. But this particular connection, we're not on a minute-by-minute minute dial-up here. We can do this all day. And the fact that there are automated, uh, integrated translation systems, if you're on Facebook now and somebody posts, or you want to buy an item on Amazon, putting aside the ethical questions about buying from major corporations like Amazon, you see a review and it's not in your language. You just click a button. This is technology enabling us to connect. And I think that there's great uh, cause for hope that this will continue to improve. I work uh, closely in the the VR and XR space as well. And uh, as a futurist consulting for organizations and companies developing this stuff, everyone's looking at opportunities for empathy. And I think that as our technology improves, the fidelity of the image that we're seeing the quality of the sound, and also being able to share environments in virtual reality space. This allows us to bridge distances and convey uh, more of the signals we need for empathy. As a species, we're hardwired to be incredibly sensitive to facial expressions. Uh, We detect very subtle movements of the eyes. And when your brain is going through different thought processes, your eyes move in particular directions that are utterly universal. They're coded into our shared DNA. But if the picture's fuzzy, it's harder to see. 
So I think we're going to discover that our opportunities for empathy across distances improve and our understanding of one another's cultural needs improve as platforms like film and narrative fiction and documentaries spread around the world. And we realize that to be human is universal and the mechanisms by which we communicate get easier. Everybody has access, almost everybody has access to some kind of internet connection. And that allows us to communicate, connect, learn and grow. Fantastic. On that very topic, Maxine, we have a question uh, from Samantha Carlin. She's the CEO of Empower Global. Um, and I would like to direct this question to you, Maxine, on this very uh, issue. She has done a ton of training using VR for diversity and inclusion, really impactful in terms of creating empathy. So um, equal reality uh, is the company. Um, could you maybe comment on, on that, Maxim, as well? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. It's, it's really interesting. I've worked with so many groups and mentored newcomers to the film industry and technology industries. And there's two parts to, to this way that people are segregated culturally. So one part of it is that people are being judged on the basis of their group, right? So it's uh, a value judgment or any kind of pre-expectation of their behavior on the basis not of their character, but of their skin color, their ethnicity, or whatever. Now, prejudging somebody on the basis of the culture that they participate in is kind of okay. That's cultural behaviors are learned. And, uh, you know, if you have a culture that likes to party a lot, then you can expect someone who's a participant in that culture to party a lot. Mm -hmm. But that is to do with your culture, not to do with your genes. And putting together, putting aside for a moment epigenetic memory and genetic predispositions, which there are some genetic markers that we can inherit that lean us towards particular types of behavior, but they're, they're influences, they're not predetermining. Uh, as long as people are not judging on the basis of what you are, but they're judging on the basis of what you do, we're all good. And actually that prejudgment does occur and, it, and people in positions of power do abuse their power and opportunities are denied to people who should have them and so on. And I think that, uh, again, things like VR experiences that allow people to share events together where they realize, oh, what do you know? You're just another human being is great. But the flip side of this is that when somebody feels like they're part of an identifiable group that is excluded or is um, uh, suffering in some way from this form of prejudice, that expectation can predetermine their behavior in ways that are unhelpful. And I'd like to give a simple example, if I may. I was mentoring some filmmakers. Uh, it was a film school. We were talking about getting into the film industry and making your first film. And the male students, there's a big line of people who wanted to speak with me afterwards. And the male students came over and they were all saying things like, yeah, you know, I want to be a director of photography. I'm going to make a film. And uh, I made one and I'm going to go out with my friends in the summer and make another one. And I am, I am working my way towards becoming a cinematographer. Great, go for it, no advice for you, just do that thing. The female students tended to say things like, uh, yes, I, I did some camera work on a film project. I'm hoping at some point to be given the opportunity to have the experience of being a cinematographer. And my answer was, who are you waiting for to give you permission to do this <laughs> exactly? Because you're all in the same course. There's a camera cupboard over there. You're allowed to take any cameras you want. Is there any reason why you would not? As an old psychologist friend of mine used to say, it's healthier to ask why not than it is to ask why should I? Is there a reason why you would not just go now to that camera cupboard and get a camera and make a film? And this group of young women all looked at each other and, and said, oh, yeah, actually nothing. So there's this presumption side mm. that needs to be broken as well. Yeah. And I think that's uh, an opportunity for education on both sides of the coin. Great example. I think Samantha in the audience could also reach out to you and connect with you on that LinkedIn. Towards Maxim, just like everybody else as well. Please we do. are racing against time because we only have like 10 minutes left uh, for this panel. Uh, Kuber, I would uh, like to move on to you. You have told me uh, in our preparation chat for this uh, session that uh, applying the principles of open source community, open source community, will be very important uh, after the pandemic. Can you explain to us a little bit what you mean exactly by that? So open source is, as I've said earlier, like, you know, it's, it's a paradigm shift from it's mine to it's ours. From fiefdoms, it belongs to us, to community, it belongs to all of us. 
And that's going to be very important. That's been very important in enabling us to communicate with things like Zoom and WhatsApp because the baseline technologies have been open sourced. It's things like encryptions and other features that are <clears throat> specific to certain products or brands, but the underlying tech is open source. That's, that's seen the exponential growth in apps and tools available to us, not just in terms of software, but also hardware. And post-COVID, I think we need to reflect back. So during these COVID days, our compassion levels, at least my experience has been, has gone up, right? Because we're feeling for each other, because we're seeing COVID come closer and closer to home. So we know what's happening. To say my aunt is pretty much the same thing that's happening to some unfortunate person's wife or his relationships or him, right? So compassion levels have come up. What I'd like to see is, uh, corporations and individuals adopt these principles of open source that I will build something, I have designed something, but I'm going to gift it to you and the world. And you guys build on top of that, right? So it's it's not about here's something I made, here go away with it. It's about here's something I made. Now, why don't we all work together to improve it? And we want to see, I would personally like to see more of that particularly around societal or social development programs, where if someone innovates or has a program that works and is impactful, then don't hold on to it. Don't, don't, I'm not going to say don't try and monetize it, but don't monopolize it. Sure, monetize it. Every open source tech monetizes in one way or another. But it's, it's about sustainable monetization. Right. It's about opening technology up, be it, you know, your your 3D printer design for a prosthetic limb or be it your amazing code for a new type of encryption or whatever it is. Just share it with the world and see where we go with it. Right? That's, That's a very interesting proposal, Kuber. Um, I saw Diana nodding your head as well. Uh, open source community, what do you think about this idea? Would you agree with that or do you have some reservations or concerns even? I think uh, I absolutely agree that if um, one human have a fantastic idea in his head and he wants to do something, to create something, and then uh, to go... He, he should go and, and share share it with human beings. We, we we need this, and I think fair enough he can monetize it as well. But as I was saying, actually we overlook these higher purposes. Uh, I tell you, I think many people uh, never actually realize how great it feels when you do something for free or you do something amazing uh, out of your uh, you know kindness. So I definitely agree with uh, this point, and um, yes, I would encourage everybody in this direction, <laughs> sharing the great thoughts. And uh, yes. the best things are for free, isn't it? Love should be free as well for everyone. Sergey, um, now coming back a little bit to the topic of uh, climate change and uh, renewable energy and so on that you are working on, do you believe that the current fight against uh, climate change and more, you know, environmental awareness and so on, the climate strikes by the young people, Greta Thunberg, that we've seen over the last uh, a couple of months and years. Do you think that this climate change fight, for example, can help us unite uh, together as a uh, humanity? Well, mm, I think that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic was for us uh, a fire drill. It was alarm, yeah. And uh, of course, we we have to we have to study this and we have to make uh, conclusions from all this. With the right rigid frame and conditions, change, of course, of course, change is possible. And uh, frameworks, our way of doing business and our way of life must change to to adapt us to to a newly recognized reality. And for sure. Uh, as I said, COVID is alarm, but what will be the next? There is no any doubts. It will be climate impact. So we have to, to recognize all this. Yeah. And we have to, uh, put ambitions and we have to put the real program, how we have, what we have to do. There are two strategies. Yeah. In general, is it to do something? Is it to do nothing? 
So obviously we do not have any, any other choice. We have to do something. Yeah. So uh, only in joint efforts and without a joint global efforts, publicly and uh, state uh, supported creative entrepreneurship and massive cooperation of all sectors, all networks, the transition to, to save our earth will not work. But I do believe, I do believe, I do believe that everything will be okay. Also, an, um, a, a realistic optimist, such as like Maxim as well, I believe. That's great. And I love your expression that COVID-19 was basically like a fire drill as well, right? So we have to really gear up and uh, take action on the climate change front, obviously, as well. Um, Lotfi, now you with uh, the creative um, society group that you uh, founded, you design basically impact ecosystems in civil society and for organizations, uh, other clients that you have. Um, you're also an advocate for what you call a true shared economy. Um, so in that sense, how are you planning to achieve that? How do you want to make the world a better place? I think uh, what we're trying to do is to, to say, like, if everyone, we need to go to the max and that if you win, for sure I will win. <laughs> So it's like we need to move away that there's not enough food for everyone. It's just we need to shift the way we measure. We need the way we shift the way we value resources and we value components. I think uh, if we use it right, we have it for life, but we need to use it with care. And we have to move away from assets. Um, social media see people as assets. <laughs> we, shun, we saw nature as assets. And when we do that, we dehumanize or we lose the, um, the value of life and we don't value life into it because we put them as object. So my perspective on this is that it would be great that we move away from a little bit the ego productions I produce for myself and, and go into the eco production as a, we produce it for everyone. And, and I think that's would be great and we'll stop abusing because it's like my kids, like we're vegetarian at home, but my, my son wants to eat chicken and said, good. Do you know what's, uh, what are you eating right now? That's, that's a chicken breast. Yeah, but what is it? It's like, you pick the chicken, you cut the head, you take the feathers out. Like, oh, that's ugly. Yeah, I know. But you have to use that responsibility. Well, exactly. Right? It's not like, oh, a nice barbecue food on the table. It doesn't come from anywhere. We need to understand what comes and you you're, need to be accountable for it. But if we're able to see people as life, we see nature and plants as life and not as asset, we will shift the relationship uh, into it. And once again, let's go back to dignity, let's go back to compassion instead of having mercy uh, around the world. And I think if we go that, we'll be able to build a shared economy. Thank you so much, Lotfi. That's great. Let's do that for sure. I would like to ask uh, the last question to Maxim, um, and then we have to wrap it up already. Unfortunately, we could, of course, talk for ages about the topic of humanity and shared humanity and what we can do to transition to a better world. Uh, Maxim, you told me for uh, this panel today that kindness, again, um, is really key to transitioning to this uh, better planet and better world. Tell, tell us a little bit about your concept of kindness that you have and that you would like to share with us before we go. Uh, Maxim, you're on mute. Yep. So you get a technologist on the call and they can't work the mute button. I was just saying thank you very much and, and I really appreciate everyone's comments today. It's been really fascinating hearing everyone's point of view. And I wanted to chime in on something that uh, Kubert said about GNU and open source. This is absolutely the future of our species. We're moving away from single unified sources of power and control towards a collective intelligence uh, endeavor. And things like GNU and open source technologies are absolutely intrinsic to that. But to answer your question about, and, and, and also Lotfi, what you're saying about you know, holistic outlooks, fantastic, thank you. Uh, it can be difficult to know what to do. How do you make choices to take positive action, really. You know, we, we love each other and we want to do the right thing, but how do you measure if your choice is a good one? 
And I think ultimately all of our motivations, all of our emotions are rooted in one of just two feelings, love and fear. And you can tell which it is when you're making a choice. Am I acting on the basis of sort of ubiquitous, timeless, eternal, unbreakable love? It just never ends. Or am I acting on the basis of separation and compartmentalization and fear and threat? Which is it? Am I under threat or am I just giving endlessly? And then you can make your decision. For fear is a very poor guide. But in terms of how we relate to others, I think kindness is the key to the next golden age for our species. Because kindness is doing what is right for the other, whether or not it's right for you. And you don't actually need kind, uh, empathy or compassion or even love to be kind. You just have to know that what you're doing is right for the other person. And then, uh, you know, then you can take action and have some confidence that you're working holistically. Uh, and, you know, the fulfillment of human potential is in the service of others. And kindness allows us to tell if we are acting intentionally uh, in service. That's kind of my piece. Absolutely. Be more kind to one another. Fascinating insight. And to yourself. <laughs> Fascinating insight from all of our panelists today. And more importantly, wonderful human beings you all are and thank you for helping us to transition to a better world for a shared humanity thank you very much for joining us let's stay connected of course on linkedin and otherwise uh, virtually but hopefully let's meet uh, in person one day soon i wish you all a great rest of the day and also stay tuned for more um, exciting panels on the Horasis uh, Global Meeting. Hopefully we can meet in person next year as well for the uh, Portugal edition uh, in Cascais uh, near Lisbon. Have a great rest of the day and nice rest of the week as well. Stay in touch. Thank, Thank, you, very you. Much. Thank you very much, Martina. It's lovely to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.